What's up guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about some basic terminology in statistics for exercise science. Now in this video, we are going to cover just a broad overview of some definitions as well as break down some differences in data and how do we categorize data and various types of numbers. Okay, so let's get right into it. Okay, so this comes from the book Statistics in Kinesiology by Ware and Vincent, the newest edition. Very good textbook. I highly recommend it. There's a link to it down in the description of this video. But in this, but in this video, we'll be talking about basic statistical terminology in exercise science. So first off, some key terms that we have to define. Okay, so the first one is kinesiology, and that is going to be the study of the art and science of human movement. But if you're in this course, then you probably already know what that is. But just to elaborate, it's both the art and science of human movement because kinesiology encompasses things like sport, but also dance and rehab programs, but also the way that humans can move in their daily activities of living. So there's a, a lot underneath the umbrella of kinesiology. Measurement is the process of comparing a value to a standard. So let's say that you want to measure the length of somebody's foot. Well, you could compare it to a foot in English units or in the metric system, you would compare it to a number of centimeters maybe or of inches back to the English system. So there are different measurements of distance, but we also have measurements of force, like the uh, amount of weight that your body has or your body weight measured in pounds or in kilograms, measurements of time, like the, numbers, the number of seconds that it takes you to complete a 100 meter swim or 100 meter run, or of frequency, so how many heartbeats per minute, or how many uh, bike pedal revolutions per minute, or pedal, uh, what is the pedal rate? Okay, and then finally on this page we have data, which would be the result of the measurement. So let's say that you take a measurement of 100 different people's frequency of heartbeats per minute, their resting heart rate, and then you put it in a spreadsheet and that becomes data. So what do we do with that data? Well, that's where statistics comes in. Statistics is a mathematical technique by which data are organized, treated, and then presented for interpretation and evaluation. Okay, so we have this huge spreadsheet. How do we make sense of these numbers and these columns and rows? You might have hundreds of variables or hundreds or even thousands of participants or data points in your study. Um, how do you make sense of all of that data? So that's where statistics comes into play. It helps us to take all of that data and condense it down into some meaningful, actionable facts or pieces of knowledge. Okay, so we could gather data from, say, thousands of different participants about resting heart rate and how that changes over time as they perhaps um, undergo some sort of intervention like a walking protocol where they walk three times a week for 30 minutes, okay? And then we plot all of those data points, but unless we employ some form of statistical analysis, we're not going to know what that data really means for us. But once we do employ some statistical analysis, then we can take that and interpret that data and maybe come out with some outcomes and say, hey, you know, walking for 30 minutes three times a week lowers resting heart rate on average by five beats per minute or something like that. I'm making that up, but that's how we would use statistics on a data set full of measurements in the field of kinesiology. Going further though, we have to make sure that all of our measurements are reliable. So that's where this term reliability comes into play. If your measurements are not reliable, then you can't trust the, uh, the interpretations that your statistics give you. So let's say that instead of using a heart rate monitor, we just ask participants in this study to find their own heart rate and check it by palpating the wrist and you know finding that uh, artery, and then counting the beats per minute. And let's say that we told them to only count for 10 seconds and then multiply by six, okay? So that would give you theoretically an estimate of the number of heartbeats per minute. And then let's say that we asked them to do that at some point in the morning instead of immediately upon waking. So each of those steps introduces a little bit of error into the measurement. So if we say that we collected heart rate data on a thousand participants, but they collected it with a heart rate monitor, then that data will have a decent amount of reliability, which we could quant quantify. 
Now, if we said that we collected data on a thousand participants using the heart rate method where you find your own heart rate on your wrist and you palpate it and then you take it for 10 seconds counting the beats and multiply by six, well, there are multiple, multiple layers of error in that measurement. And so the data will not be very reliable. A, we might not reproduce it consistently. So maybe another study would find completely different outcomes because maybe they had their participants count for the full 60 seconds, or maybe their participants were wildly off in the location of their heart rate palpation. Um, and that would change the results, okay? And then, and then the, next, the next key term would be validity. So this is the soundness or the appropriateness of the test measuring what it is designed to measure. So when we're measuring some biometric data, so some form of human physiology or physical characteristics or fitness characteristics, we need to be sure that we're measuring what we're actually intending to measure. So let's say that we are interested in the strength of a set of athletes. Well, if we measure their strength using a vertical jump test, we could collect force values from the force plates, but we know that that force that they produce during a vertical jump is limited by time. When you jump vertically, there's a, a very uh, small window of ground contact time, about half a second, during which you can apply force. And most people cannot achieve their full force output in that half second during their counter movement jump. A much more valid measure of strength would be something like an isometric mid-thigh pull, where now we have the athlete strapped into a bar and they can push into the force plate for about four seconds. And, and at some point around two to three seconds, their force will peak, their force output. That's a much more valid way to measure strength. So our measurements need to both be reliable and valid. So in any research st study, we have what are called variables, and then we have what are called constants. Now, a variable is a characteristic of a person, a place, or an object that can assume more than one value. So really, it's anything that's free to vary, either up or down. This could be an individual's body weight, it could be their strength output, it could be the girth of their forearm, it could be the number of repetitions of an exercise, it could be their mile run time, it could be their VO2 max. Really, it's anything that can change that's different between individuals. Then a constant is the opposite of that. It is a characteristic that can assume only a single value. So this would be something like a person's age or a person's body weight if, if it wasn't a longitudinal study and so you measure their body weight just at that one time point. Um, or it could be a person's sex, male or female, or it could be the distance in, in a sprint test, right? It could be 100 meters, or it could be a mathematical constant like pi, 3.14, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so a constant doesn't change, a variable can change. Now we have also different types of variables. So the first type, and the type that is probably the most familiar to you would be a continuous variable. Now, continuous variables can theoretically assume any value. So distance can be uh, any value from zero on up, or force it could be any value from zero on up to infinity, or time. A discrete variable, on the other hand, is only limited to certain numbers, usually whole numbers. A discrete variable could be something like your finishing place in a marathon. You can finish first, or second, or third, but you can't finish four and a half right, or you can't finish 27.35, okay, there are specific whole number places in your marathon placing, so that would be a discrete variable. Another example would be the number of children, okay, I know that people in America have 2.5 kids on average, but uh, really you can't really have half a kid, so that would be a discrete variable as well. So those were some different types of variables, but let's say that we collect some data on these variables, how do we classify that data, okay, so that's where this acronym, no oil in rivers, comes into play. So the, so the N stands for nominal. So there is, we have nominal data, which is mutually exclusive categories. Uh, this is anything that does not indicate an amount. Okay, so an example could be sex, male or female, or political party, Republican, Democrat, independent, um, libertarian, Green Party, right? So these are essentially names. Uh, nom means name. So it's a nominal variable. Uh, let's say that you were classifying different type of types of track and field athletes. Well, one of the nominal variables could be the event that they compete in. So you could have sprinters 
and distance runners and throwers. Or you could get even more granular and you could have short sprinters and medium sprinters and you could have middle distance athletes and long distance athletes and you could have uh, uh, throwers and you could have jumpers and you could have decathletes, right? So those would all be nominal uh, variables. An ordinal variable gives you the quantitative order, uh, but it doesn't indicate how much better one score is from another. Okay, so uh, ordinal implies order. So let's go back to our marathon example. If you had 100 people run a marathon race, the ordinal variable in that example would be the place that they come in uh, in the marathon. So you can have first place, second place, third place, fourth place. Those are in order, but it doesn't tell you how much ahead the first place runner was. Let's say you had a field of 100 couch potatoes, right? Or let's say 99 couch potatoes and one uh, Kenyan distance athlete. Okay, so that Kenyan distance athlete will be first and one of those couch potatoes will be second. But that doesn't tell you how big that gap is between the uh, Kenyan trained distance runner and the couch potato. Okay, you have no idea of that magnitude until you look at the time. So the next classification would be interval data. So interval data has equal units, meaning that there is an equal interval between one, from one unit to the next. Okay, so this is something like temperature. The Fahrenheit and the Celsius scales are an interval scale of measurement. Joint angles is another thing. The interval between each unit is the same. However, zero does not mean the absence of this quality, okay? So in this case, the zero is arbitrary, okay? So zero degrees does not mean the absence of heat. It just means that it's really cold. And you can even go negative, and there's still some heat to be found, but it's just a lot less than when the temperature is positive. Now, a ratio uh, data set, or a ratio scale, on the other hand, is based on order, like ordinal. Um, it has an equal distance between uh, scale points, and it uses zero to represent the absence of a value. So for instance, time, if you have zero seconds, that means no time elapses, or zero meters for distance, that means there is no distance, or zero mass, that means there is no mass for the object. Whereas with temperature, zero doesn't mean the absence of temperature or the absence of heat, because it's arbitrary, it's interval. But a ratio scale is different. Um, so ratio would be data like distance or time or force or, um, or Kelvin, the Kelvin temperature scale is based on a ratio scale. Okay guys, that was a short intro into some of the terms you need to know to understand statistics in kinesiology. In the next video, we'll be covering classification of data. So I'll see you over on the next video. You can click on it somewhere on the screen. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I'm Dr. Gooden, and until next time, move well, live well, and keep teaching other people to do the same. Because I'm recording a video, and if you sit right there, it's gonna make lots of noise. Thanks, buddy, I love you. Apologize to Annie and be good.